Good morning everyone. I'd like to thank Fabio and the other organisers for the invitation to make this presentation this morning on calibration of underwater camera systems. I'd also like to thank them for their willingness to allow me to do a recorded presentation. Um, unfortunately I can't be there in person um, with you today um, but I will be available on Skype after the presentation to answer your questions. I'd like to acknowledge my um, co-researchers um, that have contributed to this presentation, uh, particularly you and Harvey and Nader Boutros from the University of Western Australia and uh, Curtin University, both in Perth. Uh, the diver-operated system you can see on the lower left of this slide is one of theirs. Uh, in this case, Sony camcorders in purpose-built acrylic housings. Uh, the boom on the front um, has a LED flashing device uh, to allow the two cameras to be uh, synchronized. Uh, Ewan and Nada also provided um, the information that's used as a case study um, which I'll present later as part of this presentation. Uh, also Alan Williams and Bruce Barker from the CSIRO Marine and Atmospheric Research Group. The towed body system you can see on the lower right of this slide is one of their systems uh, used for deep water habitat mapping. And finally Mike Capo from the Australian Institute of Marine Science uh, again, he's provided some images and some videos for this presentation. Calibration isn't necessary for many applications underwater, particularly mapping type applications where you might be seeking 5 or 10 centimetres of accuracy. You can use a correction lens to remove uh, the refraction and Ivan Off and Cherney published a paper back in 1960 about these types of correction lenses. Or you can use a 2D in-plane fit to correct the uh, measurements that you take to grid rectangles like the example on the lower left um, of this slide. So in many cases um, calibration is not necessary or not critical um, for the measurement task at hand. However the range of applications for underwater video systems has expanded in the last few decades and in many cases we're now dealing with 3D objects. Um, applications such as um, the archaeological site you can see on the lower left of this slide and of course um, the area that I've specialised in um, which is uh, marine biology and the measurement of lengths of fishes and sharks um, like the example shown here. Um, if you're dealing with a 3D volume then you must correct both for the refractive effects and also camera calibration. Um, that's required particularly because um, there is a variation or there will be a variation in scale throughout the volume and that must be corrected by the calibration otherwise there will be scale errors particularly at the extremes of the range um, at which you are measuring. Um, typical accuracies in the marine biology area are around plus or minus one percent of the length and we'll see some examples of this later um, and this um, while it might not seem to be very accurate in terms of in-air uh, metrology applications um, it's a major improvement on visual census techniques that is divers estimating lengths um, of fish in the water which would typically um, would have accuracies of the order of 20 percent to zero percent. Um, so a huge improvement in terms of uh, diver operated stereo video systems um, which started in the 1980s. The top level predators in any ecosystem are a very good indicator of the health of that ecosystem. Uh, that's also true of the underwater environment so the top level predators like sharks and tuna um, and that type of fish um, are good indicators of the health of that marine ecosystem. Uh, if you can measure the biomass or the weight of the fish um, then any changes to that biomass measured over time or space um, can give you early warning um, of changes to the environment. Uh, we can do that by measuring the length of fish because the top predators uh, generally speaking grow continuously from birth to death and they grow on a very regular pattern which can be modelled by regression analysis. So if you can measure the length of the fish you can quite accurately estimate the biomass of the fish. Uh, that has the obvious application to reef communities uh, where you can do regular sampling of the fish and look at changes in the overall biomass of particular species 
Um, it also has strong application to the aquaculture um, industry. Um, the fish are caught, um, in this case southern bluefin tuna, um, in the open ocean and are transported into the aquaculture facility at Port Lincoln in South Australia. There are very strict quotas um, on catches to ensure the sustainability of the species. So that can be done by measuring um, the fish as they are transferred from the, um, the catch phase to the, um, the grow out cages or the um, fattening cages. And then another application is to look at growth rates, so to look at the uh, efficiency of the feed regimes and the fattening of the fish before they're taken to market. Uh, in this slide on the lower left you can see a, a relationship for herring uh, between weight and length and see um, that curvilinear relationship which is very regular. Um, and on the lower right you can see a, a validation exercise that we did at Port Lincoln where we measured the length of the fish with and a number of other um, measurements with the stereo video system and then did a validation of those measurements using calipers and um, then weighing the fish individually. For most top predators in an ecosystem there's also a curvilinear relationship between length and age. You can see here on the left of this slide uh, again a, a graph for herring um, showing that relationship uh, and on the right we see a population distribution that's been derived from sampling many fish, in this case Snake River Salmon. Um, you can see uh, in here that there's quite a um, large dip in the population distribution, um, clearly showing that there is some impact, um, possibly from overfishing, um, on that population. Uh, photogrammetry has the um, great advantage that it is non-destructive um, in determining population distributions. Uh, the other classic method of determining age of fish is to extract the otolith, which is a bone in the ear of the fish, and look at the rings, uh, similar to the rings um, of a tree, and from that you can determine age, um, but of course you have to kill the specimen um, to extract the bone. So underwater stereo video systems have the advantage um, that it's non-destructive sampling. You can look at the population distribution over time or over spatial extents uh, again to determine the impact um, on populations um, over um, a period or over an area uh, again with reference to other factors that may be happening within that space. In this slide we see a graph of frequency versus length for fish um, taken from many samples of different species um, in a particular area in this case Bowling Green Bay um, over um, a period and it shows how rich and detailed the information can be um, of um, the fish within a particular region or ecosystem or indeed a marine protected area. Um, so you can see here um, the high frequency of the smaller species um, onto um, heading towards the right of the graph showing the lower frequencies of the larger species. So again a very uh, rich and detailed data that can be derived from length information captured by stereo video systems. And in this graph you can see uh, the relationship uh, between different areas and different uh, depths of uh, measured data. Um, this is using a baited remote underwater video system. Um, you can see in the, um, in the uh, image there. And it compares a marine protected area uh, with a fished area. Uh, in this case um, surface observations on the left and then demersal which means near the bottom um, of the water column um, on the right and you can see the stark comparison between the um, surface uh, bruvs um, showing some high frequency within the marine protected area then much lower frequencies in the demersal um, within the marine protected area and then uh, much lower counts um, for the um, fished area um, on the far right and some species missing altogether. In this slide we see a brief history of the development of underwater systems um, starting in the 1850s with the first uh, underwater images which were taken using a diving bell. Um, then in, uh, the next major um, advance in terms of uh, photography was the Rolly Marin underwater housing um, in nine, invented in 1949 and you can see the modern version of that on the top left of this slide. Uh, then in the 1950s there was a huge surge 
um, in activity underwater, um, scuba diving, um, feature movies, um, lots of exposure of marine uh, ecosystems. Uh, but the first real um, metric application of uh, underwater photography was the um, invention of the Nikonos uh, underwater 35mm camera and we saw the first applications uh, particularly to um, seabed mapping to archaeological recording um, happening in the 1960s. Uh, then in the 1970s and 1980s uh, there was a lot of activity around stereo cameras um, and there's a famous paper by Klimley and Brown um, in the mid 1980s um, where the lengths of sharks were measured for the first time. Uh, then in the 1990s, the 2000s, we saw the development of digital systems, um, recording initially to um, digital videotape um, and then to solid state. And then of course in 2006, the GoPro revolution started. Uh, the calibration uh, techniques that have been used have um, evolved with time and have certainly become more rapid um, as the systems have developed and um, the demand of um, so much video, so much um, capture of imagery underwater um, has really generated the demand for very rapid calibration techniques. Calibration techniques underwater can be broken down into three primary types. Uh, the first is shown here on the top left um, which is a correction lens. It um, effectively makes the water invisible by correcting for the refraction at the um, glass water interface. Um, it's similar to the dome port approach that we see on many camera systems and it gives you a very consistent field of view for the camera. On the top right um, we have a pre-calibration process. So you see the Manhattan type 3D test field which can be lowered into the tank with the cameras and the cameras are pre-calibrated. Uh, this comes from a paper by Turner in 1992 um, where they were pre-calibrating cameras to then measure corrosion on the uh, legs of oil and, and gas platforms and rigs in the North Sea. But by far the most common technique in recent times is in situ calibration using a calibration fixture of some type. So we see the typical geometry um, on the lower left of this slide and then the process of measurement on the lower right of the slide. The geometry of the network is typical of any type of calibration. So here the stability of the camera system, the convergence and the redundancy are all paramount to ensure an accurate calibration. On the right of the slide we can see that they're using a LED device to allow synchronization between the left and right cameras of the system and they're rotating the object rather than the cameras. Uh, the cameras are less maneuverable, especially the larger systems. Those types of systems are less maneuverable so it's easier to move the object than it is to move the cameras. But again the same considerations apply between in air and in water. The reliability, the stability of the system is, is absolutely important um, and you have the same constraints around the geometry of the network, so convergence, redundancy, rolling the cameras um, so that you can accurately determine the, both the camera calibration and the relative orientation of the camera stereo pair. Uh, over the years there's been many debates uh, about um, what is a self or a system calibration, what's pre-calibration, what's in situ calibration, um, and I don't want to reopen that debate. Um, most of the approaches that we see underwater um, are what I would call really pre-calibration using a self-calibration technique. Uh, there's relatively few examples, true examples of self-calibration where the object of interest is used as the calibration object. Um, a paper by Shuey et al. Um, using, um, sorry, measuring um, fishnet underwater um, is one of the few examples um, that I've seen. Um, most approaches um, use the pre-calibration approach um, either in situ, so in the same area as the measurements are made, or in a swimming pool or in a tank prior to the calibration. Um, in situ calibrations with a calibration fixture use a self-calibration approach. The advantage is that the self-calibration object, the calibration fixture, only needs to be uh, have geometric stability for the period of the measurement for the calibration. Um, so large objects used as calibration fixtures can be disassembled and transported between different sites. Then um, you use the starting coordinates for the targets um, to initiate um, the um, calibration uh, processing. 
you must have scale um, within the calibration fixture or within the calibration field um, so that you can um, accurately determine um, for example the baseline between the two cameras in a stereo pair um, that can be provided using scale bars it can be provided using um, known distances on the calibration fixture between targets um, and again the stability of the camera and the optical path that is the relationship between the lens of the camera and the housing um, must be stable um, during the self calibration self calibration techniques can be broken down into at least three categories um, possibly more and we may hear about more approaches during the workshop over the next couple of days however uh, there are three main areas I believe uh, the first is absorption by the standard physical parameter set um, where the uh, standard physical parameter set is used to um, correct for the refractive effects um, the second approach is a geometric correction approach where um, the geometry of the housing um, is um, modeled um, and um, ray tracing is used to correct for the refraction and then the third option is the more generic approach um, which uses a perspective center shift um, it comes from a recent paper by Talon and Fillin um, the relative orientation must also of course be computed along with the camera calibrations um, and this can be computed either using a constrained network solution or from doing some post-processing from the network output data um, so you either have a, um, a base and rotation constraint between the cameras within um, the network or you look at the uh, positions and orientations of the cameras that are produced by the network and derive from them the relative orientations um, of the cameras in this slide we see um, a table giving some comparisons between the advantages and disadvantages of the different techniques uh, correction lenses for example um, very simple solution uh, but still requires a self calibration or a calibration um, if you want to achieve high accuracy levels uh, absorption um, no change to the calibration algorithm you can use a standard solution um, but there may be some residual effects that are not modeled accurately because of the way the absorption process works uh, geometric correction in theory can fully correct for a refraction for a specific lens cover type or a specific port type uh, but the solution uh, that will be presented here is a reasonably complex two-phase solution and it's very specific to the optical path geometry and then finally the perspective shift again can fully correct for refraction um, however some terms within that generally are neglected um, so once more um, there may be some uh, concern about residual effects that are not modeled accurately the absorption approach is based on the principle that the refraction is a um, symmetric um, effect around the center of the frame or around the optical axis so the radial distortion profiles can absorb um, the principal component of the refraction any small non radial effects anything that is asymmetric can be absorbed by the other terms within the standard parameter set so decentering distortion um, and again potentially the image affinity term so the correction within the image space itself uh, the two graphs on the bottom of this slide on the left you see radial distortion and on the right decentering distortion for a uh, Sony TRV 900 uh, camcorder um, it has a um, relatively small sensor but quite a large field of view um, the two graphs show you the in air and the in water profiles of distortion um, the in air is the grey curve with the triangles the in water um, is the black curve with the squares and you can see um, the quite dramatic change um, in the two distortion profiles um, which are correcting for um, the refractive index um, the radial distortion specifically for um, the symmetric component um, the decentering distortion will be the asymmetric effects perhaps from a misalignment between the camera housing and the optical axis of the camera uh, concave lens covers um, reduce distortion and increase the field of view in a similar fashion to dome ports um, on underwater housings um, this particular geometric correction solution was developed by Lee um, and other authors back in 1997 and it's very specific to the concave lens covers it's a two-phase calibration so in air first to determine the standard parameters and then in water second to determine the lens cover parameters such as the center of curvature the radius um, and the refractive indices um, all the refractive indices can be predetermined um, for the solution 
Um, this is one example of a number of different solutions um, that have been published, um, all of them very specific to the type or the geometry of the housing or the lens covers. The alternative is the perspective centre shift solution which was developed by Tellum and Philim in the paper in uh, 2010 specific to a planar housing or a planar port for the cameras. It determines the standard physical parameters, uh, again refractive indices of the glass and the water, distances between the perspective centres and the, and the port of the housing, then the tilt and the direction of angle between the optical axis and the normal to the housing, uh, housing port, and finally the housing interface thickness. Here we see the geometry of the perspective centre shift, and you can see on the top left uh, the delta F component, which is the um, shift based on the uh, apparent direction of the refracted ray. Uh, a number of parameters here are not included. Um, the, particularly the uh, Tellum and Philin uh, found that the direction of the tilt of the uh, port relative to the camera was not um, did not have a significant effect for um, noise of um, around about plus or minus 0.2 of a pixel. Um, the correction for the interface uh, thickness um, can be absorbed by um, the perspective centre shift um, for a thin port housing. Um, any residual effects are then assumed to be absorbed by the standard calibration parameter, so the physical parameter set. The calibration fixtures that are used are typically the light open aluminium frame type cuboid, which you can see on the lower left of this slide. Uh, however, we're seeing more and more um, use of the uh, Bouget toolbox based on um, MATLAB um, using the checkerboard that you can see on the lower right. In both cases the integrity of the object and the size of the object are critical. Um, the object has to retain its integrity for the duration of the imagery. With the cuboid we use self calibration. Um, you use only the starting coordinates of the target so that you can disassemble, reassemble the cube as required. Um, for the checkerboard of course it's effectively a test field, so the regularity and particularly the flatness of the checkerboard um, has to be retained um, for the period of the imagery for the calibration. You can compensate for um, the size of the object by moving it around within the field of view. It's important to ensure that you get full coverage across the field of view, and this is regardless of whether calibration is in air or in water, to make sure that you get a very accurate estimate of the distortions across the entire field of view, and of course the refraction throughout the entire field of view. Um, size is also a critical factor. Um, the fixture must suit the expected distance range of the measurements that you're going to take, or the volume of measurements you're going to take. So the fixture should be um, a similar size. Uh, the um, um, alternative again is to move the object around um, to fill in um, the range. Um, this is the typical extrapolation interpolation issue um, that um, you have to fill that volume to ensure that you um, don't have extrapolation effects where you might get scale or other systematic errors. Uh, the calibration object, um, as I've mentioned, has to retain its integrity due for the duration of the imagery for the calibration, either in situ or self-calibration. Um, the advantage of some of these um, cuboids is, of course, that um, you can disassemble and reassemble them. Um, if you start dealing with very large cuboids, then you can um, use bracing um, so that they maintain their shape, as you can see on the right of this very large cube um, that we experimented with um, at one stage. In this table we see some typical results from calibrations of underwater camera systems, both stereo video and single cameras. You can see that the RMS image error is of the order of around 0.1 to 0.3 of a pixel. The RMS um, XYZ errors is shown there for you. The Shuey et al. paper in 1996, there's a large error there and a relatively small proportional error there because of um, the non-rigid fishnets that were used as the calibration object. You can also see the proportional error um, varying quite substantially. Lee et al. in 1997 um, with the geometric correction approach had fairly poor results, but largely because they used uh, an aerial type geometry and were measuring only to the nearest pixel. Uh, the last item there is um, Fabio Menner and his colleagues, who um, of course are the organisers of the symposium, the workshop, 
they achieved a very um, favourable proportional error in this particular case. This is the Costa Concordia survey, so we're dealing with an object which is tens of metres long, um, so the proportional error becomes quite favourable because of the small error that they achieved for the target locations. However, RMS image residual, again around 0.1 to 0.3 of a pixel, is not a good indicator if the calibration fixture is small compared to the volume, if it doesn't fill the field of view. So a much better indicator can be either identified corrections to known locations of the targets or the corrections to the lengths typically on the rigid bars of the calibration fixture, the open cube type calibration fixture. So that can give you a more accurate indication of the actual accuracy achieved underwater. However the ultimate test is the validation and that is to use a scale bar or to use an object like a fish silhouette of known length and move it throughout the field of view. You can see here on the lower right that process happening and um, the, the known length is being used um, throughout the field of view. It's been used in various orientations um, at various ranges which replicate uh, the volume of measurement. The corrections to that known length then become a very true indication of the actual accuracy that will be achieved underwater. In the marine biology and ecology disciplines, accuracy or validation results are presented always as the percentage error of the length measurement um, because the principal measurement that is required is the length of the fish or the specimen and here we see some typical results. Um, in some cases it's my interpretation of the results that have been presented um, within the paper or within the publication. However you see that we're typically working around the half to one percent area. Um, in the best cases um, we're looking at around about 0.1-0.2 percent error in the length of the fish. So this is clearly a limitation caused by the calibration, caused by the attenuation of light through and loss of contrast um, through the water. Um, so there are many factors at play here um, which will always reduce the accuracy compared to an in-air situation. Um, I should also very quickly talk about calibration stability. Um, the graphs on the right here show uh, a couple of different examples. Uh, the top right is again a Sony TRV type um, camcorder um, in, um, in a period before we really understood how critical it was to connect the lens of the camera to the housing port so that there's a rigid relationship. And here you can see um, some of the calibration parameters varying wildly. Uh, on the lower right um, is a GoPro Hero 2 camera uh, where we had a very stable setup uh, in the underwater housing um, using some packing and um, some other devices and here we have very little variation in the calibration parameters uh, across a series of um, some 9 or 10 uh, calibrations. Um, again the calibration applies in the absorption process, the calibration applies to the entire optical path so that camera port interface, the rigidity of that is absolutely essential uh, to ensure that you have stability um, of the system. I'm now going to present a case study um, which is based on some research work done with um, Ewan Harvey and Nader Boutros um, where we did a comparison between the MATLAB uh, toolbox solution as, um, pro as provided by Bouget um, using A3 and A4 checkerboards um, compared to a standard or what we think of as a standard um, cube using self-calibration. Um, the system used was a stereo video uh, camera system, um, two Sony um, high definition camcorders, uh, purpose built housings um, with very rigid connections between the camera and the uh, port. Um, the relative orientation was included as part of these tests along with the calibration. Um, and we also did, as part of this test, we did a comparison of three different base separations. Um, as you can see, 150, 400 and 830 millimetres. The range of base lengths that we chose is reasonably representative of practice. So here you see a table of a variety of different applications and uh, on the lower part of the slide um, a number of different systems with various base separations. Typically there's a very strong correlation of course between the base separation and the intended range of measurements so that you have a reasonable base to height ratio as we like to think of it in terms of aerial photography. Uh, the system on the lower right um, with a, a 1.4 metre baseline um, was one of our early test systems um, and it worked beautifully and gave fabulous results but manoeuvrability was of course very poor because it was such a large system.
the other systems you can see there are both drop baited remote underwater video systems drop cameras if you prefer and diver operated systems this graph shows the results of the validation tests um, indicating measurement accuracy for the three types of calibration. Uh, this is based on five calibrations and then five replicate measurements of a known length within the field of view. You can see the results for the A4, A3 checkerboards and then the cube and note the split in the vertical axis indicating that the A4 calibration approach produces significantly poorer results than the other two approaches. Here we have graphs of the variation in parameters from a series of five calibrations for each calibration type. The boxes give you the weighted mean and range of the calibration parameters. The error bars again are one standard deviation and I think it's very clear from this graph that the results with the cube are very very consistent um, compared to the A4 and A3 checkerboards. Clearly the A4 checkerboard because of again size related issues is um, the weakest of the three solutions. Uh, here we see a comparison between the three base separations for the Sony camcorders. Again this is based on five measurements of the standard length at each of those ranges starting at 2 meters and finishing in at 12 meters. Uh, you can see that there is still some bias in all three systems. At the largest base separation bias is running at around about um, half to one percent. The surprising um, result here I believe is that the very short base of 150 millimeters um, performs remarkably well out to about eight or nine meters um, and then deteriorates quite rapidly because of the short baseline but nevertheless it's surprising how well that very short base performs um, across that range. The ultimate test of these systems in terms of uh, marine biology and ecology um, measurements is to look at the, the biomass estimate, that is the weight of the fish. So using the correlations that we've seen before, the curvilinear relationships between length and weight, uh, we can simulate the error that would be f experienced for a 400 millimeter length snapper, typical fish in Australian waters, and you can see the comparison here across a range of 2 to 8 meters using the cube, the A3 and the A4 checkerboard. And of course you can see with the A4 checkerboard the poor accuracy performance from around about 5 metres starts to impact and out at 8 metres which would be a limit of the range based on both um, sensible practice and also visibility in most circumstances. Uh, but the error is getting quite large, almost 50% error in the weight of the fish. Um, and we see here the comparison between base lengths uh, this is using um, the uh, three different base lengths with the cube calibration, the cube base self calibration. Um, and again, you can see with the very short baseline uh, beyond about eight meters, um, with also some other areas where the uh, performance is questionable, but certainly beyond about eight or nine meters for the 150 millimeter base and beyond 10 meters for the 400 millimeter base, um, the errors become quite significant. Um, clearly, uh, there needs to be a limit based on the base length of the range of measurements um, you could argue that um, the 800 millimeter base um, is quite effective out to the visibility limit whereas the 400 and 150 millimeter bases need to be limited to ranges of perhaps less than 10 meters um, and less than maybe five, uh, five or six meters respectively. So what analysis and conclusions can we draw from the case study? The 3D calibration clearly produces improved results better accuracy, better precision, better reliability, particularly when you look at the variation in the parameters of the calibration um, across the repeated calibration. The 2D checkerboard objects produce less favorable results and that's partially due to the fact that they are 2D objects um, trying to replicate a 3D solution by movement within the volume. Um, however, they are inherently 2D objects. There's also a confounding factor here which is to do with size. Uh, the 3D calibration object, the cube, has the advantage that it is much larger than the A3 or the A4 checkerboard. So there's still um, scope here for further analysis, further research to separate out the 3D influence compared to the size influence. For me, the surprising result here was the performance of the stereo cameras with short baselines. The short baselines gave surprisingly good results out to the edge of visibility 
and out to a range which would be limited by common sense and is reflected in um, the typical practice um, as we saw in the table showing the relationship between measurement range and baselines. However, it's equally clear that the performance deteriorates very quickly at longer ranges. So there must be some sensible limits to the range over which um, you would measure with those short baseline systems. The proliferation of cameras like the GoPro and um, digital camcorders and indeed digital SLR cameras um, that can operate in different modes um, is generating the need for different approaches to calibration and certainly more rapid calibration and that's partially also because of the sheer volume of recordings um, that are being made that require analysis. Um, of course the GoPro can operate in different modes in terms of resolution, in terms of field of view, in terms of um, the frame rate. And similarly um, digital SLR cameras um, can operate in movie modes and um, it's been shown by other research um, that those still and movie modes are not um, transferable. So you require separate calibrations um, in still mode and in movie mode. So I, I believe that there is a lot of fertile ground here in terms of calibration research um, to determine um, which techniques are going to uh, be most suitable for the different modes of operation um, for the different settings that cameras may have. Um, equally different algorithms are likely to provide um, improved results um, depending on the housing type. Uh, for example, you could surmise, um, untested, but you could surmise um, that the plain type port on some housings um, may suit the absorption method. So a very simple geometry may mean that absorption is very effective. Uh, whereas um, you might expect that curved acrylic housings, the dome ports, um, may produce improved results with geometric corrections um, simply because of the complexity of the ray tracing uh, between the object in the water and um, the image um, in the focal plane. Um, again, there's lots of scope here for research uh, to determine what are the optimal approaches and what are the optimal techniques. So, thank you for listening. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to make this presentation um, and I'm uh, available um, via Skype um, to answer any questions that you may have. Uh, thank you again.